3 dm jayers what's going on uh i'm gonna officially dub this team nerd it is uh me and brian minor on this one um and uh we're excited to be talking about a topic that i think a lot of people have questions about and that a lot of people have misunderstandings about and that they think might be holding them back but it is not and we're going to talk through what that is and that is specifically body fat set points which means one thing in the scientific literature means another thing in the minds of most people who have the question hey can i lower my body fat set point and the practical realities are disconnected from probably both of those to some degree so um yeah brian when's the first time you heard someone say something about a body fat set point or you were introduced to this term i think it was in the original body recomposition book from, uh, from lyle and uh yeah it's some of it's evolved over time but you know i've, I've call, always sort of had a flexible like view of it you know knowing yep. that it's not a spot on a map but um yeah you know i think genetics play a role and maybe we need to kind of define what it oh, is yeah. and um, i think that's one of the challenges so like you said, you, you're aware that it's not a spot on the map and that genetics play a role. Um, how was, uh, like, what, what do you think quote, the quote unquote, like internet's perception of what body fat set point is or has been or changed I, over time? I, I think the internet probably leans more towards the genetic side. Like this is gen like my genetics dictate, this is where I'm going to be. Uh -huh. Like this is where my body protects you know and it's going to be more protective against um you know fat loss than than fat gain obviously but i think we it's easy to sort of ignore all of the other elements like the environmental elements that i know we'll get into yeah so i think what what's kind of cool about this is that i was not aware of the most i would say defensible model of understanding body fat regulation until probably close to 10 years after it was actually proposed by John Speakman and colleagues in a review paper in like 2011. Um, and before that, and I think still the dominant discussion is using the term either body fat set point or sometimes the acknowledgement of like a body fat settling point. And people kind of just loosely say that and with some acknowledgement that look, it's not all genetic. There's also, you know, behavioral components. Um, but if we actually go back to the history of the science on this, which I think is quite fascinating, the lipostatic model, which sounds like a set point because lipostatic, so that's a fixed fat point, right, was actually proposed all the way back in 1953, which I think is quite interesting. So this has been a concept that's been around for like a really long time. And the interesting thing about it is when we think about the 50s, it's an important context because there was two things which are important to note. One, this was before the obesity epidemic. And two, it was also before the point where we had actually discovered leptin, which was in the 90s. So Kennedy proposed that there was a lipostatic model in 1953. That's like more than 70 years ago now in 2024. And it was the idea that body weight was regulated by some type of signal uh, probably sent by adipose tissue. And this is what they thought, you know, to the brain indicating, hey, this is where body fat stores are supposed to be at. And if they go below that, then you get hungry and you eat more. And if you think about 1953, this was shortly after the conclusion of World War II. This was after the Minnesota semi-starvation study. And seeing that when you get POWs or people who had survived a concentration camp, access to food, they rapidly regain weight. Um, and once they restore a certain amount of body weight and body fat, they stop. And pre-obesity epidemic, before the point, you know, 30, 40 years later, where we started to see that, you know, if we give everyone free, cheap access to food and we reduce the amount of energy expenditure they have and we make it taste really, really good, we make it easier to eat, improve the mouthfeel and all the various 10 plus factors that contribute to obesity epidemic, oh wow, kind of everyone just keeps sliding upwards. And the obesity epidemic is probably the largest anecdotal threat 
to the idea of a lipostatic model, right? Um, Because then we have to go, okay, well, what's going on here? Why are people just gaining weight past this point where supposedly they're at their set point, they should be fine. Um, And this is where kind of the the concept of, oh, well, something else is going on here. So in the 90s, they, they discovered leptin. And leptin... I think if it had been discovered 20 or 30 years earlier, it would have been a really solid set of proof to go, yep, that's the lipostatic model, because it is largely explained by variation in body fat. Um, there's studies where you just take a population of 500 people across various body fat ranges, measure body fat percentage, measure circulating leptin levels, and body fat will explain 60, 70% of that variance. Strong relationship, right? But the funny thing is, and this is what really kind of threw investigators for a loop. After the discovery of leptin, we go, oh, this is the signal for the this model. But in the 90s, we're seeing the obesity epidemic. It's like, it's a little more complicated than that. So they started measuring leptin. And they found that in common obesity, people with obesity had really high leptin levels. So this is insufficient to explain what's going on here. So if leptin, for those who don't know, it's kind of considered the primary signal of saying you're well-fed, and in high states of leptin, um, you can you will, you will probably want to eat less based upon this original model, and you'll start losing the weight. Uh, and leptin levels get really, really low in dieted states, and that's what signals the hypothalamus to then, okay, we're going to drive more and more overconsumption. But apparently, it seems like leptin only explains the fat loss defense. It doesn't explain the upper uh, set point, if you will. And when we observe animals, uh, especially other mammals, especially prey mammals, we see that they defend not only a lower set point, but also an upper set point. And in some mammals, like for example, rats, who are prey animals, they defend it just as well as weight loss. You take rats, do you overfeed them with high fat chow, or you you underfeed them by just not giving them enough chow, because, you know, the life of a lab rat is not great. they will quickly expend energy and upregulate their energy expenditure and metabolic rate to uh, get back to a weight that that is in a range that that that, that individual rat feels is appropriate, uh, and they will also regain weight. And some of the epidemiological explanations for this, which Speakman goes into 2011, are that hey, there is a downside to being too heavy or too light. And for a prey animal, like a fat rat is just a tasty, slow rat for a predator. Um, so it's it's not going to go well for that rat. It's going to go great for that cat, though, who found it. Um, and then for a human, we've had pointy sticks for a long time. And our ancestors have had pointy sticks, fire, and the ability to climb trees and go in caves for a long time. So there is far less of a threat to our species and the ability to pass on our genes from predation than there is from having, say, a suppressed immune system from low energy availability and being very light. Like, we can function. We can have, like, the typical hypogonadal male, like, hunter-gatherer society where we're all five foot five and we have just enough testosterone to make a kid, you know, and (laughs) we keep the woman home in the tribe. You don't get to go hunt because you will get low energy availability then you can't breastfeed or have a child. We got to pass this gene on. And don't worry, we'll have 15 kids, two of them will live. Life is great for for humans, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? But nonetheless, it makes sense when you think about it from that perspective with food scarcity and less of a risk of predation that we're quite good at defending weight loss, but not weight gain. And this is where the whole obesity epidemic comes in and the development of what's called the dual intervention model by Speakman and colleagues in 2011, which basically states that, hey, we got two set points. We've got an upper intervention point and we have a lower intervention point. And is it those points which are individually determined where we see physiological changes in the body that are meaningful enough to really start to drive either weight gain or weight loss? And the unfortunate thing about being humans who are not prey species is that a lot of us are pretty crappy at defending that upper intervention point. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's it's a bank that hasn't gotten robbed very frequently. So we'll just put like one guard in the front and then the back entrance, you know, just to make sure you lock the door, you know? And then all of a sudden there's been a rash of bank robberies called the obesity epidemic and they're all coming through the back door. So some people are quite good at defending that upper limit. Um, other, others are not. And the typical human is obviously not, hence the obesity epidemic. 
But we do see, you know, metabolic adaptation or adaptive thermogenesis does go both ways, but it is highly variable when we look at that upper intervention point. Um, probably heard the term NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That's the most variable component of our total daily energy expenditure. And in some people, you overfeed them a thousand calories, and this has been empirically tested. Some people, their energy expenditure goes up 600 from fidgeting, postural control changes, and, and other aspects of total daily energy expenditure. Some people, it doesn't change at all. So they're in a functional 1,000 calorie surplus when you give them an additional 1,000 calories. Other people are in a functional 400 calorie surplus. But what is very robust and very consistent is that when you diet people down to single digit body fat percentage, male or female, almost everybody's going to see some degree of reduction in energy expenditure and it will be a lot more homogenous. So that's where we're at today. And I really didn't find out about this until a few years back because the, you know, certain science things come into the fitness industry. We kind of latch hold of them and that just becomes the common parlance. But what a lot of people talk about with this acknowledgement of the environment or the acknowledgement of society or behavior or all these things um, and saying that, yeah, there's this range I tend to feel okay in or, or that I can maintain without much effort. What they're actually describing is the dual intervention model. So this isn't a complete surprise to people because I think it matches our observations. But it's good to actually have an understanding of it and why it is asymmetric and why it's part of the reason why we've been, uh, you know, why we've seen the obesity epidemic develop, but it's still, and why it's so hard to, to try to lose weight or get really, really lean for the competitors. So anyway, I think that's, you know, a little bit of a, a sit down and have a science story from, from Eric, but I think it's useful to understand that because some of the assumptions that are baked into the set point or lipostatic model really kind of break down when you think about it. That's in, that's interesting. I know the one thing I didn't know there was the the predatory animals are more protective against the weight gain. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's you another, see it very it's consistently in, in rat models and mouse yeah. models. Is, is they are quite good at upregulating energy expenditure far better than than uh, than primates. So would you say it's better to be a lion or a sheep? You always want to be a lion in the jungle. <laughs> Just another reason. That's right. So, so uh, Brian, I don't know how many times you get this question, but I get it all the time. Is it possible to change my set point? Now, do you get that question a lot? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got it this morning, actually. <laughs> there you <laughs> so go. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you get it a lot. And the answer is... Well, it's kind of yes and no. No, you can't change the fact that there is those ranges, you know, that there, uh -huh. that, that range is going to exist and there's going to be a level of body fat that your body simply pushes back and doesn't like to get below. I think that's, I think what a lot of people ask that their hope, like the ideal answer for them would be, yeah, you can get, get shredded reverse diet your way back up and all of a sudden your set points now at eight percent body fat instead of you know 12. yeah and so that that's just simply not the case so um but there's a large a huge behavioral and environmental component to kind of where these lines are at um mm -hmm. especially the the upper end i think the lower end is significantly more fixed than in the upper end and that's largely dictated by environment um you know i've had i had an athlete a few years ago who lived in in mississippi and i remember i was trying to give him like a step count you know to, to work with and he's like no he's like dude nobody walks around here like there's there's uh -huh. nowhere nowhere to walk it's miserable outside it's and so naturally i think you know you look at different regions of the country some environments are just more prone to, you know, that's residents being obese. And, and I think that's, you know, the, the reality of it is, you know, your, your habits and your environment play a significant role in where your body likes to hang out. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that there are those, those, I don't want to say lines in the sand, especially on the upper mm -hmm. end, but the, the lower end, you're always, it's always going to suck when you get below your lowest intervention point. No, that's, that's perfectly well said. And I think it's important to clarify 
what goes on between that upper and lower intervention point? And that is, so to go back to your point, I completely agree that when people ask the question, can I change my body fat set point? You're typically not all, some people are just academically interested. And to answer that question, we're not hundred percent sure. We do think that, you know, fat cell hyper hyperplasia is a thing and that the number of fat cells you have, um, might have something to do with these genetic components of it or physiological components of it, I should say, and that it is easier to observe, I'll say, the creation of new fat cells than it is the loss of fat cells. So if there is, and this kind of goes with the whole, you know, we're better at defending one than the other. If it, if that is true, that means we're probably more capable of changing our upper intervention point for the worse, or rather, sorry, more capable of changing our lower intervention point by pushing it higher than we are necessarily pushing it lower. But yeah. I think that's like the, the strict answer is we don't know. There's some hints that, that maybe it can change, but not in the way that we want of being able to, to reduce it. Even if you stay weight reduced for a long time, unfortunately, a lot of data on people who have lost a fair amount of weight and until they regain a fair amount of that weight back, they stay uh, experiencing adaptive thermogenesis, right? But I think the question is also implying in most cases, and someone's not just asking an academic question, it's asking from a place of frustration, one, because they're talking about their set point, which they see as a genetic thing, which is linked to determinism, right? So this is, I have no agency here. Can I change this, 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 this unfortunate reality I'm in, like my genetics are, are I'm, I'm stuck here is what it feels like. Can I change it? And I think the good news is to know that despite the fact that you probably can't change it, at least not in the way we want, you might be able to make it worse, is that that's probably not the thing holding you back. Um, most people who are struggling with their weight and struggling with um, unintentional weight gain and overconsumption that passively drives their weight up, in I would say more than nine out of 10 cases, it has to do with the environment. And when I say environment, I literally mean, if we're using the, this kind of model, everything that is not physiological. That means deciding to change your nutrition habits, lifting weights, uh, your step count going up. These are all things that are in your control. Those are considered environmental changes and they can make a really substantial difference. And you were talking about how different societies observe different things. I mentioned briefly about hunter gatherers, you know, pre-agricultural folks who are basically all hanging out at or below their, around their lower intervention point and have experienced food scarcity. They're basically the, the typical, like you, you see the same kind of parallels in overtrained, low energy availability, experiencing minimal symptoms of reds, endurance athletes in the modern world, people who are under fueling for their sport, right? Um, that parallel exists in hunter gatherer societies and their energy expenditure is lower than you'd predict based upon their activity because they're seeing down regulation of other areas. But there's a really interesting thing that you can do is look at some of the research on post-agricultural, but still non-industrial societies. So for example, uh, if we think about like Quakers or other traditional uh, people living in some of the colonial nations like Canada and the United States, like the Amish, for example, um, there was a really cool study by Bassett and colleagues where they looked at the physical activity and body composition of just under a hundred Amish men and women from a community in Ontario, Canada. They did not use electricity or gas power and like eight out of 10 men were farmers and the majority of women, seven out of 10 were housewives or homemakers. Um, and what they did was they gave them pedometers, they tracked their step count and they assessed their body composition and they found, and again, they're making all their own food. Okay, so even though it's post-agriculture, it's more quote unquote modern, they're at that point in society where we start to see far fewer infant mortality deaths and people have food availability, yet they still have to be quite active to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. So the men were walking on average 18,425 steps per day. And even the women were walking 14,200 steps per day because there's a lot of activity that goes into chores and we don't realize just how good we have it in modern society, like dishwashers, washing machines, shoot, even irons, you know, stuff like that, right? So anyway, the body fat percentage on average for the men, 9.8% body fat. 
So, and, and the women, it was a little bit higher, but it's also heavily confounded by the fact that they're, and I don't mean this to like degrade them, but like they're, they're pregnant most of their adult life. So it's, it's very challenging to get, you know, kind of what, what would their body fat percentage be if yeah. they were in, in a, a more, you know, typical, uh, hormonal state. Not, not that there's anything wrong or atypical about being pregnant, but it is a unique physiological state. Right. So, um, anyway, I think it's interesting looking at that data in the men is they're highly active, but also they're eating. So these guys are consuming. Uh -huh. If you look at some other research on Amish, uh, folks are on average, like 3,600 calories a day. So it's a state of high energy flux, high energy, uh, high food availability, but needing to do a lot of work to get it. And I think that's what our physiology is primarily more adapted to. If we think about the amount of time it took us to go from hunter gatherer to agricultural, to then agricultural to end industrial, that last little piece is only a couple hundred years of us being in a post industrial society, right? So when we see our activity levels go down, things get dysregulated. You know, um, when we talk now about what is considered sedentary of, you know, roughly under 5,000 or 4,000 steps per day and getting above that up into like the seven to 10,000 steps per day is when we start to see like reductions in all cause mortality and, and better health. And that's kind of like where we're, that's like the minimum threshold of, of what I would describe as a normal metabolic regulation level of, of activity. And below that, it starts to disrupt metabolic health and hunger and it leads to passive overconsumption. So I think it's it's helpful to understand that our body fat set points are actually a lot lower than maybe we realize on average, um, and that that's, that's not the issue, right? Um, considering where like the Amish are in terms of, 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 of this kind of looking at that and then looking at where modern society is, we start to see that there's all these converging factors that make it very challenging. Even if you were trying to live the quote unquote bodybuilding lifestyle, like I'll speak for myself, if I don't take two walks per day intentionally, I won't even get to 7,000 steps, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's hard, you know, even as someone who dedicates their life to trying to be as healthy and as fit as possible and specifically trying to compete in a sport that rewards a, a leaner physique, um, in modern society, it's, it's, it's probably harder for me to chill around my, my lower intervention point, knowing what it is, having studied it and actively been lifting weights for 20 years to try to be as muscular and, and lean in my, as my walk around physique as possible compared to a dude who's like, yeah, I get up, I pray. And then I, 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 I farm the fields and I feed my, my 45 kids and that's it, you know, like, and I'm shredded all the time yeah. and I don't think about it at all. I eat butter, right? Yeah. I mean, I have big goods and, uh, and, and, and I drink full fat milk, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's the the environment is not doing us any favors <laughs> at this stage. Yep. And I, I know for me, yeah, I'm the same way. I'll if I don't make a concerted effort each day, like I mean, today, what time is it? It's two I'm at two thousand steps right now. There it's been go. a relatively low active day for this time, but I've been stuck in a chair most of the day. But yeah, I, I think people really overestimate uh -huh. how much they're actually expending throughout the day. And it's, it's a significant reduction. Absolutely. So let's talk about brass tacks a little bit here. I think, I think people understand the background. They understand the differences between modern society and, and reality and, and what is actually the barrier. So the answer is no, you can't change your, your intervention point, at least not to any meaningful or helpful degree, but that's probably not what's holding you back. And the thing that is quite depressing for obesity researchers should be actually quite empowering for individuals who are looking for lifestyle change. And I because what we've seen is that, wow, when we have less sidewalks, when we can don't have to commute to work for any job anymore, which has even gotten worse after we've gotten quite good at telecommuting from COVID, um, when food is tastier, higher calorie, greater abundance, ultra process, like all these things are conspired, you know, to, to result in expanding waistlines, right? That's really difficult to deal with as an obesity researcher, because you can go, man, people just can't live their lives and not just gain weight in industrial societies, right? So that requires individuals to completely change their lives to be healthy. And that's not realistic for, for public health advice, you know? 
Yeah. Do a bunch of things you don't want to do is typically not what works, right? However, for the individual who says, you know what, I'm in a state of empowerment. I want to make a change. Right now I have a strong goal. I'm intrinsically driven to do it. I'm willing to hire a coach. I'm willing to listen to this long ass podcast from this guy named Eric Helms who won't shut up. Like you clearly are willing to subject yourself to some things you don't want to do or most people wouldn't want to do. Like listen to me, monologue. So that means you're probably at a point where you're ready to do something. And the good news is everything that is not your physiology is something you can modify. And the options and the things you can do that have nothing to do with changing your set point are like, there's a ton. Yeah. And, you know, there are whole books written about behavioral change that don't even get into tra tracking macros. There's whole books written about exercise. And there's, a, and there's a ton of content we have on this podcast where we've talked about things you can do. And they all fall, fall under the category of environment. And I think if anything, it is just sometimes overwhelming to get all these different messages. But the good news is there's a ton you can do to essentially try to recreate your own food environment to take agency over it. Buying things from the super, from the from the grocery store where, you know, it's it's gonna nudge you towards a higher fiber, lower energy density, higher protein, more fruits and vegetables, more micronutrient, lower fat, moderate carbohydrate diet. You know, that's just on the nutrition end. Getting a Fitbit and and like, you know, Brian and I have to do finding a way to go take a walk every day, which is good to get out in nature, get some sun, get some vitamin D. I always think of how can I combine that with something useful? You know, like mm -hmm. for me, when I listen to a podcast and I'm, I try to do that when I commute, obviously, but when I'm not commuting or driving somewhere, I go, you know, well, let me take a walk. Let me walk to the grocery store. Let me walk to go do something. I try to find ways to walk and listen and learn. Um, and I think there are many other activities as well that can count as activity, if you will, that don't require you just feeling like I'm taking a break from things I need to do to go walk because yeah. that's typically not sustainable. But re-engineering your environment is huge. And it's something that with most of my non-competitive clients, it's where I start. Where 10 years ago, I would have started with, hey, let's get a food scale. Let's download my fitness pal. And let me teach you about macros and calorie balance. Because really the problem is energy in, energy out, which is... I mean, that is technically the mechanistic problem, but that is a result of the behavior and the environment with, that is passively leading you to overconsume. And just like the advice kind of fails at the population level, if you ask someone to ignore the things that are leading them to overconsumption and just don't do that, being the advice, yeah. and here's how you don't do that, you know, like, so you're eating too many calories. How about you, if you tried eating less, you know, is, is kind of the 2010, uh, you know, like, like quote unquote, I think I'm evidence-based advice. But I think yeah. in, in 2024, my advice is what are all the things I can do to change your habits without even telling you you need to get into a deficit yet that should shift you closer to an environmental change, which will make your habitual behaviors more conducive to being closer to your lower versus your upper intervention point, making you have better hunger uh, you know, regularity, a more nutritious diet, feeling more full after meals, and having things that support, you know, having a plenty of muscle mass. And obviously everyone's lifting weights who listen to this podcast, so they've gotten that part taken care of. But there's so many other things that, that I want people to do from the educational standpoint to the habitual standpoint to changing their local environment that I think are really critical. And I think sometimes jumping into macros first instead of doing those things is actually harder. Because now you're you're still in the food environment where you got Oreos in the cupboard and you're like, all right, I guess I can have three, you know? Yeah. You're still in the state where eating at a surplus feels like maintenance because you are you're, you're don't have enough activity levels to regulate your hunger on most days at least. And I think asking someone to track macros, track their food is just basically going, how long can you white knuckle it for? And then when yeah. you fail, guess whose fault it is? It's you like every other fat bastard of society. You know, it's like this... It's, it's, it's putting too much onus on someone when they are not even understanding why they're in the state they're in and that it's not a choice, um, really, you know, if, if, you, if you are born and you live in an industrial society. You can make the choice to change your environment, but if you don't even know that that's the issue, then I don't think it's fair to really, you know, to, to, to kind of throw that at somebody. Yeah. That's just at least my take. I don't know how you see I it. I agree 100%. I think it's, uh, and I'm the same way, you know, 10 years ago, 
yeah, you kind of over time stop treating people like machines. You know, they're, they're, we're not robots and, um, yeah, changing the environment. I mean, if you're prone to over consuming calorically dense snacks in your cupboard, you know, every time you're hungry, like make that scarce, you know, it, yep. like establish some new habits. Like there's nothing wrong with kind of putting you in a position where you just don't have access to that for a while. Um, and you know, the counterpoint to that would be, oh, we want moderation and like, we want to practice moderation. I, that's, that's true. But I think especially out of the gate, what it holds a lot of people back is seeing like they, they want to see results quickly, it? you know, and sometimes taking, you know, kind of drawing that line and saying like, okay, let's, let's not buy that stuff for a while it helps, you know, create that initial momentum to, you know, and then once they have 90% of the other habits in place, you can start reintroducing some of that stuff. And, and I think a lot of people that sustain fat loss for, you know, a long period of time, oftentimes they're looked at as kind of like the example of people that have lowered their body fat set points when really they've been doing it long enough, their behaviors have just been overhauled. And so it, it makes maintaining that significantly easier. So, um, yeah, I think what I try to tell people that are trying to lose, you know, any substantial amount of weight is like, we want to do this right. So coming out of this, it's not, you know, we're, we're not just jumping back into what we we're doing. We have an infrastructure in place to support, you know, continued progress and sustainability with it. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with everything there. Hey, 3DMJers, this is Andrea Valdez popping in with some really great news today. We just released Nutrition Fundamentals for Lifters, our latest course in the 3DMJ vault by our chief science officer, Eric Helms. This is the foundation of dietary understanding that every athlete needs before they start calculating their calories or their macros or any type of meal planning. All of those counting and tracking skills are great to learn, and of course, we already have vault courses that cover them, but if you don't know their purposes and limitations, you'll likely shoot yourself in the foot by overestimating their importance and becoming overly reliant on them. There is so much wasted time trying to learn how to track food, how to lose fat, how to live life while hungry, and how to think about food all at the same time. And every experienced bodybuilder knows that the mental models are what should have come first. If you don't know how to holistically and productively think about your nutrition, it doesn't matter how much willpower or discipline you think you have. It'll all eventually snap. It always does. And you'll be forced to go back and learn these skills in the long run anyways. We've seen it time and time with our new athletes, and it's the first thing that we have to address before letting them enter another fat loss phase that will likely fail if we don't take a few steps back and get these things down. So since we've dealt with this problem so many times before firsthand, we knew it was something we had to add to the vault and we can't wait for you guys to take the course. Nutrition fundamentals for lifters will go over energy balance, maintenance calories, behavior and habit tracking versus food tracking, how to find where you fall on the flexibility versus consistency scale, how to use body weight measurements, how to know when you're ready to cut or gain, five different ways to track your food and a whole, whole lot more. This is the 25th course in the 3DMJ Vault, which is our online learning platform of organized video-based education for serious lifters. And you can become a VIP member and get access to every single one of those courses by purchasing an annual or lifetime membership with a single one-time purchase. Head on over to 3DMJVault.com and sign yourself up today. That's 3DMJVault.com to get all access. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the rest of the show. I think there's a balance to be found with capitalizing on the motivation someone has initially when they've decided and committed to wanting to make a change. And sometimes the typical fitness messaging that does get people to come read your page, buy your product or typically product, not services. And you'll see why in a second when I explain what I'm talking about is what is easy to sell is easy changes. If you take this pill, if you follow this easy diet, you do this quick fix, or maybe if you just white knuckle it for a few weeks, you'll be good to go. 
Uh Um, That is 99% of what's sold in the fitness and diet industry. And that unfortunately does not fix the problem for all the reasons we talked about. But I think a lot of people think that quote unquote evidence-based or sustainable or healthy approaches to dieting shouldn't feel like dieting at all or shouldn't feel like a change. And I think the goal is to eventually make something that you do become habitual. But the sheer fact that you're not currently doing it means it will be hard to change. (laughs) Like, you know, making yourself get up and take a walk and, you know, adapt that into your schedule and like do like things like habit stacking and make a conscious decision to not stop at a fast food place at 5 p.m. when you're tired after work and you got kids to feed and go, okay, I'm going to go to the grocery store. And you're going to think, you know what, what I really should be doing, man, I got to go to grocery store on Saturday, you know, not, not on Sunday when everyone else is there. And, and then it's so like, I, I get socially fatigued, but Saturday morning, I'm going to go to the girl. Like I need to figure out a way, you know? So you like, but that's, that, that is something that is a new behavior that is not immediately rewarding. And I think the only way to take on new behaviors that are not immediately rewarding is to capitalize on the time period when you are motivated, you fed up, you want to make a change and you decide to do it. And I think it's a, it's a disconnect sometimes when evidence-based coaches, they get someone who comes to them and said, I'm, I'm, you know, just like, uh, like I think it's Arnold or Lou Ferrigno, I'm ready to drink blood. You know, I I will do anything to, to get, (laughs) you know, on, on stage in this kind of shape. They come to you with that and you go, listen, what we're going to do is we're just going to do one new behavior, like one new habit. We're going to drink a glass of water in the morning. Okay. For the next month, let's do that. And then next week, what we're going to do, you know, like that kind of, I think that kind of approach is not really meeting the person where they're at. It's Mm. almost the assumption that everyone is crippled by the same factors that have led society to the obesity epidemic. And I think it is true that on average, if you just pick a random person out of a crowd, they're not at a point where they're trying to make a change because they're just living their lives and they're kind of in a bad situation like everyone else. But when someone says, hey, take my money, help me change my body and change my, my lifestyle, you want to figure out what's the most they're willing to do and then simply give them things that are going to set the groundwork and that infrastructure you talked about. Hey. And I think the mistake that I've made in the past is that thinking that tracking calories, learning how to use my fitness pal, weighing themselves, like I give them the tools for dieting rather than mm. like maintenance and behavior change first. And I've learned that as unintuitive as that is, like before you've lost weight, you're not like I'm teaching you how to maintain weight. But the reality is that when people come to you, they've been gaining weight. Mm-hmm. They don't actually know how to prevent weight gain. Yeah. So, and they probably do know how to lose weight. They've probably done that a few times. Not the most effective way, mm-hmm. but like dietary restraint, even when you do it right, it still requires restraint. So what we're trying to do is create this environment. And again, going back to the idea of environmental changes, where we've created all these habits that are not directly connected to fat loss, then don't require restraint, but they do require conscious willingness to change habits. And then once those get onboarded, it makes everything else afterwards easy. And when they do go through a fat loss phase, they're reverting back to that rather than reverting back to what got them there in the first place. And that's when you start to break the cycle of repeated weight regain and even, you know, weight cycling and overshooting, which is very common. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about overshooting? That's a good, good, uh, I think a lot of people probably don't understand yeah. that outside of like the physique community. Yeah. And, community. and fortunately, I think most people who are not physique competitors who lift weights will not experience overshooting because the main causational factor of weight cycling and overshooting, which let me define, is just simply the idea of you go through this crash diet you regain weight and you typically lose lean mass during the crash diet because you did something like a bunch of cardio, maybe, um, and drank onion soup and nothing else for food. And then you binge eat after having lost a substantial amount of body fat because you created this enormous deficit. But that deficit was not supported by resistance training. So you're losing probably on average somewhere between 25 to 40% of your fat loss, depending on how big that deficit was, as lean mass. And then when you rapidly regain fat, you're going to regain some lean mass, but not much. So you're kind of in a worse position each time you come out of one of these cycles. And not just physiologically, but also from a psychological perspective. Because again, when someone comes to you or they don't come to you and they decide to jump into something hardcore like the onion soup diet 
and the walk 20,000 steps a day combination is they are ready to do something extreme to make a change. Yep. And for a period of time, their identity changes to someone who does hard things. And when you see yourself as someone who does hard things and then you fall flat on your face and you can't stop yourself for overeating and you're beating yourself up and you're seeing yourself just kind of degrade like and go back to where you thought you wouldn't be anymore, it erodes your self-efficacy. And then each additional attempt trying to do that, it's like almost like re-traumatizing you. And now you're getting this PTSD related to the dieting process and eventually you just stop trying. And the, even the idea of dieting is something that is, it freaks you out, you know, and it, and it, and that's, you know, that's where the term like diet culture comes from. You know, that people, they've been through this so many times, they've gone back to the well and all it's taught them is that I'm a shitty person who can't do hard things. That when they get exposed to information about weight loss is they see it as like this inherently harmful thing. And it's, it's a, it's a very tough space to be in, you know, uh, and it's why you see fights between, you know, dietitians on the more kind of weight neutral approach versus the, no, there are times and place for healthy fat loss. And it's, 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 it's a difficult place to be in, in modern society because of how hard this can be. Now, yeah. o- overshooting for contest prep competitors though, um, there is a big difference between operating within the intervention points from upper to lower and pushing yourself all the way below it. And I think this is, this is important. I'm going to talk about one more theoretical concept that we kind of misunderstand, and that is quote unquote metabolic adaptation, uh, or adaptive thermogenesis. We tend to say like all things during contest prep are actually that. And adaptive thermogenesis is a thing and it is repeatable and observable, uh, under two general circumstances. When someone loses a lot of weight, independent of whether or not they got below their lower intervention point. Um, and, or they had a really, really big deficit and they did crazy things to lose weight, somewhat uh, independent of how much is lost, but primarily driven by how much weight was lost. That's one thing. And it does have similar mechanistic pathways. Being below your lower intervention point is another thing, right? And technically having lost a lot of weight and then having an acute, very large deficit those are also sort of different things. Mm-hmm. And that's the difference between low energy availability or losing weight in a decent amount of energy availability, like dieting slower. So your intervention point, the size of the deficit, how much weight you lose, and then also another one, if we talk about exercise energy compensation, how much activity you're trying to do in the process of this all can have independent effects that we would probably kind of in the general evidence-based community or bodybuilding community call quote unquote metabolic adaptation. And the beauty of being a contest prep competitor who's successful and gets shredded is you got a full house. You got them all, right? You're doing <laughs> so much cardio that it is down regulating your neat and potentially actually physiological aspects of your energy expenditure, like your BMR. Even a reasonably lean person in the off season, like like Brian, like when you're not at the peak of your off season, what's your like walk around weight? Like 205, 210. Maybe a little, what do you compete at? Uh, 179. So yeah, you go from 210 to 180. Okay. You're losing 10 to 15% of your body, uh, okay. of your body weight. Okay. Yeah. That's considered clinically meaningful weight loss, yep. which also means adaptive thermogenesis. <laughs> like yeah. you, you lost enough weight. If you look at data on people with obesity who lose and maintain 10% weight loss, they sustain a certain level of adaptive thermogenesis until they regain some weight, unfortunately. Now, I say unfortunately, but when you look at actual correlations, people who are currently experiencing adaptive thermogenesis, which is just defined as, I burn fewer calories and be predicted by my body mass, that predicts that they've actually successfully lost weight. Because that's what it's a function of, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and that just goes to show you how powerful the environmental factors are. Like you can be experiencing adaptive thermogenesis, which again is separate from being below your lower intervention point, And you can be fine. Like you're slightly weight reduced. You're not burning as many calories. It doesn't mean you're necessarily starving and ravenously hungry and need to restore body fat because you're not below your lower intervention point. But because you've lost a lot of weight to get there, you're burning a few less calories than pre-predicted. But you're okay. You don't, you wouldn't know that if I didn't tell you that or bring yeah. you into a metabolic chamber, right? Mm-hmm. So Brian Miner, he goes from 210 to 180. 
he's ex- experiencing metabolic adaptation because he's lost in six months, you know, 20 plus pounds, right? Um, as he dips below wherever, and we can, we can talk about our own individual experiences here, maybe, I don't know, 9% body fat for you, 11% body fat, something like that. Now you're getting compounded by the fact that you were below your lower intervention point. Your body fat percentage is so low that the actual excretion of leptin is lower constantly. Mm Because even though leptin does fluctuate when you eat, like when you eat food, leptin goes up, your baseline levels, because your body fat is so low and below where you want to be, that's constantly low. So that's two whammies. And because of that, you're actually burning less calories, right? And your needs going down, you're feeling more lethargic. They're like, well, I got to offset that if I want to keep losing body fat. Let me jack up my step count, maybe do two formal cardio sessions. Now you're doing more activity than your body wants you to do. It goes, you know what? I'll, I'll give you 60% of that. You know what? I'm a loan shark. I'm not going to give you the full 100% of your energy, expend- energy expenditure from cardio because you're already doing some dumb things that I don't like. So we're going to do some exercise energy compensation. And we're going to drive your BMR down a little bit more. And we're going to drive that need down a little bit more. And you get, you know, like a decent exchange rate here. You know, yeah. you're, you're converting your currency here. You're not going to get all your cardio. So now... While your total daily energy expenditure is preserved, you're seeing more hits on your physiological, uh, you know, status. There you go. Now, the only thing you didn't do, because you're hashtag evidence-based and you're part of Team 3DMJ, was you did take six months to do this instead of three. But if you'd said, you know what, I want to get to that same place in three months, you'd be adding another fourth component to that of low energy availability. And that can happen independent of all these other factors, right? So if you take a woman with obesity... While she's sedentary, so no exercise energy compensation, not below her lower intervention point, and before she even starts to lose weight to have lost a lot amount, a lot, a lot of weight to experience metabolic adaptation, and you put her on a starvation diet, you're going to start to see symptoms of low energy availability. And what the hell is low energy availability? We've talked about it before. It's simply consuming fewer calories relative to your lean body mass and your exercise uh, expenditure as to what you need to maintain physiological function. So you can take a woman with obesity, or there's parallels in men, which I'll get to in a second. For a week, you give them a 800 calorie liquid diet. They're going to see changes in luteinizing hormone pulsatility. And if you take them through a full month, they will probably start experiencing menstrual cycle disruption. Uh-huh. In a male, you will probably see drops in testosterone, potentially uh, no more morning erections, or at least a different frequency. And that is happening before they've lost a ton of weight. That is happening without exercise. And it is happening well above their their lower intervention point. So yeah, crash dieting to also get to that same place. That's 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 one of those modifiable factors. You know, losing mm-hmm. weight slowly, so you have the highest energy availability you can, but still being in a deficit, which eventually it does become impossible because of all these factors converging together. There's no way to have a high energy availability when you're trying to get the five percent body fat as a male yep. or a nine percent body fat as a woman. And that's why I think weight cycling is a it does happen in competitors who manage to overshoot sometimes. And B, why it's actually quite challenging for a competitor who does find where their lower intervention point is to know if they're actually there. Because are they ravenously hungry because they're doing two cardio sessions per day? Because they're 5% body fat? Because they're on 1,200 calories? Or because they've lost 10% of their body weight? And the answer is yes. And so it's like to all, <laughs> yeah. you know, so I don't know about you, Brian, but uh, how do you kind of navigate that? And how do you figure out when you do have the opportunity with, let's say an experienced competitor who you're coaching, um, where should they hang their body fat hang out to be? And is it dictated by just their intervention point or is it f- other factors? I think it's, it's uh, one question I often ask is like, okay, were you, how was your weight growing up? Like mm-hmm. that, and sometimes that can lead to some genetic insight into into things, and and also environmental um, factors as well. But you know, if if there's somebody who is formerly obese, you know, and their lower intervention point could be higher than than somebody else, and and so like you you kind of just have to look at I get kind of hate the term like bio biofeedback in a way <laughs> you know you have to look at things like libido food focus mood i know you know the when i get below mood fortunately i feel like stays pretty intact for me for the most part 
Um, but when I know I'm like really dipping below, it's when I feel like I'm, I've got like cinder blocks tied to my feet, you know, where, where every voluntary movement feels like a chore. And I think that's like a surefire way of knowing like, okay, my body is pissed off that we're in this state right now. Yeah. Um, so anything it can do to conserve energy. Um, but like you said, I mean, it, it's hard to like, some of that stuff can exist, you know, in the absence of, uh, you know, being below your low intervention point. But I do feel like I, I've never, I've never like crash dieted. Um, but just like that baseline energy level, just being tanked, usually that coincides with body fat levels that are pretty scarce for most people, um, or scarce compared to their lower intervention point. So, and that's hard. I mean, there's like no prep is easy for anybody, uh, or it's very, very rare, but some people absolutely suffer more than others, you know? And, and I think that's, that's something that maybe 10 years ago, I wouldn't have like been as on board with, it's like, okay, you getting shredded. It's, it's an equation, you know, like this is, yeah. this is what we need to do to get there. But yeah, I mean, all of these aspects and these variables that you've discussed, they all push harder. They're all amplified. You know, the, the higher your lower intervention point is getting shredded is going to amplify all of those to a larger degree. So, you know, people that are formerly obese, you know, that are trying to get shredded, like it, it's, it's hard, it hurts, you know, it, it sucks. Um, but yeah, things like, you know, just overall baseline energy levels, um, hunger, food focus, libido, you uh-huh. know, menstrual cycle regularity, like all of that, it's kind of this melting pot of evidence in a way that, that, and there's no way of knowing which one is necessarily indicative it's just kind of the sum of all the parts in a way yep and you can tease out some things especially if you're potentially willing to get blood work or Mm -hmm. um if if you've ticked certain boxes but not others but a lot of the times it's so challenging post-show to do anything except just overeat um Mm -hmm. or on the other end of the spectrum if someone has maybe a history of being very a very restrained eater or a prior history of eating full-blown eating disorders um and if, you know, they have maintained being very lean and have had to been like coaxed into having a proper off season, sometimes it can be very challenging for them after going through contest prep with being okay with coming out of a state of being a little, you know, low in energy availability, yeah. skirting just below their lower intervention point. Um, and this is something that for myself personally, I don't think I've ever been at risk at until I had enough experience and enough changes to my environment to where I could hang around my lower intervention point. And I think I'm doing that right now. Like, I think I'm, I'm coasting on that line. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, too. Yeah, yeah, and you would know as my coach who's gotten the reports. But like, uh, this is a little personal example that should hopefully be instructive and not just, you know, me making this about me. Um, Barb went to Australia to do some data collection for her PhD in geology. She had to look at the specific laser. Very cool stuff, real scientist. And while she was away, some very minor changes to my behavior happen. Like I have my stuff locked in. Like I still was walking to go to breakfast, eating the same food, you know, walking home, going on a second walk, training five days a week, eating the same lunch that I eat all the damn time and, you know, eating out maybe once or twice a week. But I didn't while she was, wasn't here because it's like, yeah, I'm just lazy. So I'm just going to, and I guess lazy means I, I bought more food. So I was having like these wraps that I make. So instead of having a variability at breakfast where maybe if Barb doesn't finish her breakfast, I eat another 100 calories of her pancakes or whatever. And then at dinner, instead of ha- I'm like having pretty much 650 calorie dinners because that's what the wraps are every time. I just make them the same because I'm a boring bodybuilder. Occasionally, you know, we would get like still healthy stuff like Japanese or or Malaysian and I would get like a, you know, like a vegetarian dish or something like that. Those could be as high as 900. So the variance in my energy intake went from being from 2400 to 2900 to basically being bang on 25 2600 the whole time yeah so my average energy intake was maybe 200 calories lower when i look back on it retrospectively um because i was still in the range that we had decided i was best but i was there all the time at kind of like the low end and i lost and she got back and barb doesn't notice changes in my physique she's like whatever this bodybuilder crazy guy she's like you look leaner (laughs) like immediately in the car in my face 
And I was wearing like a, a short sleeve shirt because it's, you know, we just got out of the summer here. And she was like, yeah, you kind of have this like more prominent resting bicep vein. And then I took a shower, I got out of the shower and she was like, yeah, you're definitely leaner. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, you have like your quad striations are more prominent again. You have quad striations. And I was like, yeah, I also noticed that I didn't have a single way in an 88. I was an 87. Yeah. And another funny thing I noticed, and here's where the instructive part is, is that I immediately, not immediately, like three days into the week or four days into the week, I started getting slightly worse sleep. So what I, I can feel, because early on in prep, I can run a large deficit and I sleep fine because I'm still 96 kilos. Like I'm, you know, 35 pounds over stage weight or whatever. It doesn't matter if I don't eat anything that day. Like I, I don't want to anyway. But when I am at a certain level of leanness and I go into a deficit on that day, I'm, I notice that my sleep is worse. So like I kind of skirted into that and I was like, oh shit, like I'm right on that line. Like if I'm eating enough and I'm in this minor slight surplus, I feel fine. But as soon as I get below it, and especially if I lose a little bit of body fat, um, all of a sudden this reminds me of August, you know, yeah. 2023. So I think there are certain indicators you can get. Uh, women have a slight advantage here where if they fix energy availability, even if they don't fix the other factors, they typically will see regularity of menstrual cycle return. Um, so long as they're not kind of in and out of that, that deficit. Um, so there's a few more hormonal reg regulators, but there's a really good paper that we can probably link in the show notes. They just released the updated uh, guidelines for energy availability and relative energy deficiency in sport um, for 2023. It hasn't been updated since 2018. And there's a really good discussion in there about what energy availability is and what are some of the signs and symptoms and things that impact it in the, um, in the, Brit the British Sports Medicine Journal. So, um, or the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Yeah, BJSM. It doesn't matter. Um, but anyway. I was going to, I was going to say, I think you mean the BJSM. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're still starting to, we're, we're only starting to understand these factors, but I think competitors need to understand that, like you said, there's a reason why it's harder for some people to get leaner than others. Like, cause the, these things impact each other. So if you have a lower intervention point than other people, you're only going to have to lose 8% of your weight to get into stage condition because you don't get rewarded for the relative amount of weight you lose. Yeah. I mean, I love that some people, they make it their bucket list thing. Like I was 300 pounds and I got on stage at 200 pounds. Like that is awesome and they should be rewarded. And there's even some organizations that have like the transformation, you know, prize, you know, <laughs> but when you're on the bodybuilding stage and the expectation is striated glutes and you're 200 pounds, but you actually need to be 170 to be shredded, you're probably going to place very low, even if you did something very impressive that might've even been harder than the dude who walks around at 176 and only has to lose six pounds to get shredded. Yeah. And they're out there, damn it. I can tell you, I met some of these, these folks at, at WBF Worlds and they stopped me, right? So yeah, some of, the, some of the freaks that are out there, it's not that they don't have to work hard, but for the same level of work, they can get further. And they incur less fatigue so they can maintain more muscle and more sanity. They can transition back to the off season easier, spend more time gaining muscle. Um, and since they don't lose as much weight, less metabolic adaptation. And also there's a, there's, a, there's another component that we haven't talked about that is kind of like a factor that impacts all of these, Brian, and that's time. Mm -hmm. How much time did you spend below your lower intervention point? How much time did you spend reducing weight? How much time did you spend in, in, in a, low, a state of low energy availability? Because once you start to have these symptoms that are physiologically mediated, you know, you actually see like organ, organ mass losses, you've got to yeah. regain that lean tissue, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, yeah. And it doesn't happen overnight unless there was a very short amount of time when you're in these really rough physiological states, which is going to happen if you have a low, a yeah. low, lower intervention point. So I think it's, it's unclear to me a lot of the times when a competitor is coming out of that, that recovery diet phase, is, is this a time issue? Are they too lean? Are we not eating enough? Are they maintaining too much activity? You know, and, and some of those things you can kind of base upon norms and averages, but mm -hmm. some of it you only know with multiple trials and experiences and, yeah. and doing it differently. Um, 2019 was very instructive for me because I got ready so early in May that I could eat up all the way through August. So I knew what it was like to restore energy availability as much as I could to be like a, below my lower intervention point to cut back on energy expenditure and go, man, I still don't, I feel better. Like I'm, I went from like feeling like 
two out of 10 when I was like at the, the lowest deficit to maybe five out of 10, but I don't want to live life five out of 10. Yeah. You know, that's not great. And, and then I immediately jumped up 10% of body weight within six weeks. I did the most aggressive version of our recovery diet because I was going to do an under 90 kilo strongman cop. I'm like, I don't want to mess around and do like stones while I'm limping yeah. and let me get healthy as fast as I can. But this time, you know, now, now we're, I think as we record this almost 19 weeks post season and I'm 88, you know, or 87, depending on the morning, not 90. So it's like much lower weight gain over, over a much longer time frame, And, and I'm leaner you, at this body weight at 88 than I was at 88. Would, in you, would you say you feel better now than you did then? I would say I feel similar. Okay. So I only know now that my lower intervention point is probably somewhere like, I honestly do think my stage weight might go up, but I'll say eight to 10% over stage weight. Yeah, yeah. Where I think before I would have guessed based upon my prior experiences when I was conflating signals that maybe I, 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 I had to be heavier. I needed to be yeah. more like 200 pounds versus yeah. the 175 that I compete instead of say 190, 195. So, you know, I'm, I think I'm probably like, if you looked at my physique right now, Brian, what do you think? 15 pounds over stage weight? Yeah. Give or take. Yeah. In that range. And it's just a slightly leaner than I, than I, than I, than I was yeah. where I thought it was before. But, I, but how do you know? Cause there's these conflated <laughs> signals. And yeah. I think that's, that's, that's a challenging thing for competitors for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of people too, you know, it's sort of a different discussion, I guess, but there's a lot of people that are walking around at that five out of 10 uh -huh. that assume that that's, they've been doing it so long, maybe out of fear of gaining weight that yes. they just have the assumption that, okay, this is my, this is where my body likes to hang out. And it's almost like the opposite issue where they are so, you know, in a groove with their behaviors in their environment that they don't really know anything else. And so getting some of those people to gain weight can be very difficult, you know, to get mm -hmm. on board with if they've, if they're all they've ever known is structure or let's say they were formerly, you know, a little bit heavier, you know, they capitalized on this motivation, started doing everything, you know, redlining everything and got down in weight, were happy with the way they looked. And then they kind of feel this pressure to maintain that. Yep. I think that's, that's very common too. So in those situations, you know, as a coach, I think it's important to be able to sell kind of the conversation we're having, like yes. teach them, okay, this is, this could be what's occurring. Now let's, let's try to increase calories. Let's see, you know, let, let's kind of ignore body weight for a minute and let's just look at, you know, your biofeedback uh -huh. and, and see if things improve with more food. And if that's, the, if they do, then that can oftentimes be a sign that they were operating below that intervention point the whole time. Yep. No, I think that that's, that's really well said. And it's really helpful for people for, for anyone who diets a fair amount of weight off or gets quite lean. Um, and I think there's one thing I want to say on that before we talk about like, what is a reasonable body fat to try to shoot for, maybe sustain and versus the messaging we get online is your favorite influencer who seems happy and healthy is probably either someone with a very low intervention point and, or someone who is comfortable, well, is sufficiently comfortable for the amount of money and clout they are getting right now, uh, being slightly below their lower, their lower intervention point. Like when you see someone who eats like they, you know, you know, they, you know how you get a salad bowl and then you take that and you put it on plates, right? A normal behavior. If they go, you know what? I don't need the plate. And their dinner is a big ass salad bowl that is in total like 500 <laughs> calories. And it's this massive volume, like, please, I want to feel satiated after dinner. And that's what I have to do to get it. Um, and they're like, yeah, what's my daily ritual? Well, I get a 10,000 step count walk in the morning, 10,000 step count walk in the evening. You know, I train six days a week, average step count of, you know, 20,000, eat my 500 calorie salad bowl for, for dinner. And, uh, yeah, I live the shredded life. It's awesome. <laughs> um, that like there's, there's, I think there's a lot of people, the incentives can align to where you can be what I would describe as a adaptable level of low energy availability, which is great. If you read the, uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine's update, there's problematic and adaptable levels of low energy availability. 
And you can be at like, eh, skirting the lower end and only experiencing like a few symptoms of reds, but not full blown relative energy deficiency in sport. And you can be like right around or slightly below your lower intervention point. And that's definitely livable. You know, like we wouldn't be here talking today if society couldn't function with Ed. semi-starved humans running around having kids, right? And this is slightly better than that, right? You're only like slightly starved. Yeah. And the money's good. You know, I got a lot of clients who are buying my eBooks. You know, you're watching my YouTube channel. I, I have some reward mechanisms in place. And I've been obsessed with my fitness. I've been a personal trainer my whole life. And maybe I haven't a slightly disordered eating pattern, all that stuff. I think be aware that people choose what they want to put on Instagram. So this glamorous lifestyle they're living might actually be that they have low libido. Um, they have to take, they have to do a whole complex ritual just to fall asleep well. There's a reason why they have a whole video on blue light blockers, uh, the right dose of <laughs> melatonin, you know, getting out in the sun in the morning. Like they don't just get to fall asleep and have a good night's rest. They have to do everything perfect, you know, to, to get seven hours of sleep or whatever it is and feel okay. And that's not just content. That is also maybe their life. So Daddy. there's people out there and they're probably selling you things who are maybe not showing you those aspects or the things that they are pitching as normal are normal if you are in this slightly restricted, uh, down-regulated state. That's one thing I think we need to be very aware of. And the impact of that getting amplified on social media is that you start to think the norm or the goal should be what is actually not a physiologically sustainable level of body fat, at least without impacts on your mental and physical health that are temporary, transient, if you were to actually be a little higher in body fat, um, for most people. Because um, again, these are people either with a low intervention point and or below their lower intervention Ow. point by a little bit. So one, I think people need to know that. And because that drives up a perception of what is a normal body fat, like... Brian, if you pulled the average dude on the internet, what would they tell you? Like, oh, well, I want to maintain X percentage body fat. Like, what would they yeah. tell you? Probably like 10 to 12, unless yeah. they're competing. It's which is one pretty of It's lean. Yeah. It's 8, 12, <laughs> 10, or maybe 15% body fat yeah. if if they have tried and, and like failed at, at 8, 12, and 10 multiple times. Uh -huh. They won't tell you 13 or 11. Those numbers totally yeah. off. You table. never, you never do sets of seven. Like no. numbers are just. No. You do yes. sets of seven. That's how you summon type, some type of demon. You mess around. Yeah. Screw up the whole, you, you turn uh -huh. the gym into a haunted house. Don't do that. Yep. That's like saying Beetlejuice three times. Yeah. The most, most people are trying to get to and maintain a level that's significantly leaner than I think they, they realize and uh -huh. it is sustainable. Um, you know, I, I'm not a huge, and, and maybe you can chime in here too, but I don't, anytime somebody asks me about body fat percentages, it's, there are so many different methods with so much margin of error. Like I, I almost find it can do more harm than good sometimes obsessing about it. Well, definitely obsessing about it, but having Absolutely. that target, you know, um, like people, like I, I've, I've never tracked my body fat actually the one prep i did track my body fat percentage was the the least lean i'd gotten so it was, <laughs> after that i mean it's just kind of the eye test at that point you know so um but yeah if you were to kind of average if you were to average all of the methods what would you say is kind of the top of the bell curve with a healthy body fat range for men and women well you know that's that's a great question because body fat at best is a proxy for health. Mm -hmm. And when we try to look at health, typically at, at the population level, we're using a proxy of a proxy. So there is, there is, I think, a study done in 2000 or 2002 by Hem, Hemsfield and colleagues. Um, Hemsworth, I can't remember. I just put it in the course that's going to be coming out, but whatever, I don't remember. I think it might be Hemsfield. Shame. And what they, what they did was they looked at body fat percentages in men and women in three different age brackets from like 20 to 80 in people of Asian, African, or Caucasian descent. And then they looked at, okay, for tw a BMI between 25 to 29 or greater than 30, or I think at 30, basically, what were the body fat percentages? And, and then in a healthy quote unquote rate range, weight range. 
Now, the important thing to, to talk about here is that BMI is potentially useful as a first stage screening tool at the population level because the probability that you have metabolic ill health when your BMI is over 30 is quite high. There's only like 6% of people between a BMI of 30 and 34 based upon the most recent analysis I've seen who are metabolically healthy. Um, but also the chance of you being metabolically healthy at a BMI of 24, it's like 50, 50. Hey. So it's, it's absolutely not a perfect screening tool. you can't be like someone walks in the office because I have type two diabetes. Go, no, you don't. Your BMI is 24. You're like, okay, but I'm yeah. still going to take my insulin today. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And 6% is not a small number of people, you know, like you can have a BMI of 30, which is class one obesity, 6% of people, like there's 300 million people in the U S right. That that's a lot of people who could be potentially in your office who as a doctor who are like, no, I'm good to go. So, but then once you get to like a 35 BMI and it's like 1% or less. So it's not a perfect tool, but if we were to go, all right, if we want to play the odds and if we want to give some type of reasonable range. Uh, for health. And ideally, I would just say, hey, go to the doctor's office, get your blood pressure checked and your cholesterol. I actually measure health if you're interested in health. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, for, 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 for general ranges, I think people would be surprised by what is the body fat percentage at a 25 BMI, like the, the cutoff for what is considered being with overweight, where you start to see some increase in risk of having poor metabolic health and not much of an increase. It really is much more noticeable when you get into the, the 30 classification. And that is basically the mid-20s for men, depending upon age, ethnicity. And it is the mid to high 30s for women, depending upon age and ethnicity. And I think the average, like the information out there is, okay, once you hit 15% body fat as a dude, you're skirting deaths. You know, like you're, you're, you're <laughs> yeah. probably going to wake up tomorrow in a diabetic coma. And that means you won't wake up because you're dead because you're 16% body fat, right? And that's just could be further from the truth. You've got like another 10% that you could probably increase that if you're still active, still lifting weights, still getting your step count in and still eating a well-balanced diet, you just happen to be in a surplus sufficient to push your body weight up and you're not doing so too quickly. So there's all this extra, you know, tri triglyceride and glucose floating around that you can't sequester in time that you're probably going to have the same health markers, your blood pressure, yeah, yeah. your heart rate, your cholesterol levels probably won't change as you go from 15 to 25%. If I had to guess if everything else about your, your, your lifestyle is, is healthy as a male, and the same thing is probably true going from 25% to 35% for women. And I just, I like, I know that most people are not going, I want to change my body fat for health, but I think it's really useful to know that one, okay, listen, the person on Instagram who you're basing what it is good to look like on, they are probably in, in, a, in a, like unsustainable state that is unique to their genetics to some degree. And they've heavily modified their life and they're accepting a certain level of, Eh, suck. Yeah. Because, you know, they want to have, they want to hit their 500,000 followers this week, right? Uh, and 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 the the relevant sponsored ads that come with it. That's not you, for one. That's not, and, and that's not based upon anything objective like health. That is our subjective decision on what do we like to see. And base your subjective, you know, decisions on what you should look like on others at your own peril, especially others who are using filters, financially motivated to do so and are deriving their income from their body. I think that's 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 typically going to set you up for failure. Yep, agreed. We had talked a little bit before the call about if, if you're an individual who has maybe a higher, lower intervention point, and mm -hmm. maybe you have this fear of, of gaining weight, maybe if you were previously overweight or obese, I think it can be easy for like a physique athlete specifically to really want to maintain a weight that is probably a higher body fat percentage than what they would otherwise like. It might even yes. make them a little bit nervous, like they're going to fall back into old habits. But in many cases, I mean, if that, if that's where you're hormonally intact, that's probably where you're going to make the best progress. So uh -huh. it's, it's kind of this, yeah, it, it's unfortunate that that's the case because you know, you lost this weight and obviously you don't need to become obese again. That's not your yep. lowest intervention point, but yeah, dial in your behaviors as best you can, like we had talked about, um, in your environment and that infrastructure. And then from there, 
like the the genetic element is is going to kind of dictate things and for a lot of people for some people anyway there's there's going to be like where they're making the best progress might not be where they want to be um and so that's kind of a decision you you have to make um because even your lowest intervention point just because that's like you're right over that threshold that that doesn't necessarily mean that's where like you're going to be performing your best either so there's there's definitely a range there as well it's just the way i've always looked at it is that's just kind of where the slope becomes more steep you know once you kind of cross that line um so yeah i think everybody's going to be a little bit different in how much they go above stage weight in, in order to have a productive off season and so um you know we the recovery diet and the percentages and guidelines like in the pyramid books and everything like th- those are just proxies for uh-huh. for what we're trying to get at and that's like a healthy state <laughs> where you can make progress and so yeah you, ha- you have to look at the um yeah those elements first and foremost and th- those are more just kind of a starting point i will i'll leave the listener with this that the pathway to success begins with your willingness to accept what is unfortunate, which is basically what you said. Um, You may be a potential world champion once you build enough muscle who happened to come from a family with obesity and your mother had gestational diabetes and your lower intervention point is 40 pounds over stage weight. That's not an impossible circumstance, but there's a lot of people who've lost 40 pounds. There's a lot of people who've lost 140 pounds. They're, They're rare. But so is everyone who gets up on a bodybuilding stage. You may not be the person who can get on stage feeling great, carb loading on 800 grams of carbs every day, and who walks around with a glute dent, you know, before they even start the diet. And if that glute dent goes away, they feel stuffed and they have symptoms of type 2 diabetes, right? (laughs) You know, Um, and I've met those people. Um, You may be the person who has to grind themselves very hard even doing things right with an evidence-based approach but once you get shredded and you get on stage you are a dominant force you might need to compete every other year at at most Mm -hmm. but you know what there's plenty of these lean shredded bastards running around who are never going to win a world championship you know it's because they don't have the physique for it Mm -hmm. so we don't get to choose which cards in the deck we have um and i've definitely met people who i i will never beat on a bodybuilding stage because of their structure their muscularity Uh, But they have the willpower to get there. But, you know, two months post-show, I'm feeling better than them. I'm leaner. They're not. You know, it's great for the gram, but I'm still going to lose to that bodybuilder, you know? So just like I have to accept the limitations of my structure and my muscularity and take it as far as I can, someone in that other position who is probably going to beat me if they get on stage and and they they push harder, is just going to accept that they might have to cut their calories lower. They might have to do more cardio. And recovery for them might happen after 20 pounds of gain instead of, you know, 10 for someone else. Uh-huh. And then the real recovery in the place where they start building muscle, to your point, Brian, where they actually make some productive off-season gains might come when they're 30 pounds over. So, yeah, it, it is a tough thing. And I think ultimately you need to treat this as an individual, which is a really excellent point to leave people with. If you have, re- if you're eating enough, it's been enough time since you dieted, um, and you're still really food focused. Even though you've changed your environment, you're doing all the things that should result in better hunger you know, control. You've, you're sufficiently active, you're regularly training, you're eating fruits and vegetables, fiber and protein are nice and high. Um, you know, If you were to do an energy available to calculation, you're, you're, in a, you're in a good state and you're really food focused. Maybe you just need to put on some body fat. Agreed. Well, all right, team. I think we've done it. This should have a lot of really great lessons for competitors and non-competitors alike. And I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. They didn't mind my monologuing too much. And so they you brought the science. You brought, I brought the, the science. science. I, ju- I just interjected occasionally. So no, good, no, you asked one. some great questions. And you and you pointed out my error with the right journal name. Um, BJSM. So BJSM, was, thank you very I much. Wanted, I was going to say it right when you bucked yeah, it up the I know, first I'm always, time. I'm, sorry. I'm always dropping the ball on those journal <laughs> acronyms won't happen again my colleague and friend so folks thank you so much for listening to another episode of the 3d muscle journey podcast we hope you enjoyed this we hope you learned something and we hope this has helped you in some way we'll catch you next time thank you 
What's going on, everybody? Eric Helms here, Chief Science Officer of 3DMJ. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And let me just take one second to tell you about MASS, Monthly Applications and Strength Sport. This is a monthly research review that I do with Lauren Colenzo Semple, Eric Trexler, as well as Mike Zerdos. These are experts in their field, and we cover all the information relevant to you as an athlete or coach if you're working with strength or physique athletes, or if you're a recreational or competitive athlete yourself. We cover nutrition, training, sports psychology, and health. And we do this in written format, as well as, since you like the podcast, audio summaries, as well as video concept reviews. If you're a trainer, we also have continuing education credits for ACSM, NSCA, NASM, and ACE. So head over to 3dmusclejourney.com, click on the products tab, and you can find us there. I look forward to seeing you and enjoy the podcast.